On June 7th, 2023, both China and Russia got together again for a strategic joint air patrol through the East China Sea and the Sea of Japan. Now, this is the sixth time they've done this since 2019. So this predates uh, any kind of war in Ukraine and any pledge that China has to stand with Russia through thick and thin. Uh, I forget the exact wording that they use, but they're supporting Russia diplomatically anyway uh, in their in their efforts over there. And the last time this type of strategic patrol happened was all the way back in November 2022, where they basically did the same thing and included going out into the western parts of the Pacific then as well. So by that comparison, this one's actually a little bit less of a flight than the one they had six months ago. I wouldn't infer anything from that. But one thing that is really interesting here is that Japan and Korea sent up fighters to visually identify the planes because they have rules about who can fly in and around this airspace. This airspace is called the ADIZ or the Air Defense Identification Zone and every nation has one. But the rules for air defense identification zone change country to country. There is no international standard for the ADIZ like there is for international waters. So territorial airspace is completely off limits to everybody, unless you're invited to come there, especially if it's a warship. But this is not territorial airspace. This is over international waters. The airspace over international waters um, is open to everyone if it's outside an ADIZ. And if it's inside an ADIZ, which in this case, it's Japan and South Korea, there's rules they have to follow. One of the most common rules is the airplanes need to declare their intent, their course, uh, and what times are going to be in the ADIZ before they even enter it. Of course, China and Russia never do that. And to be fair, neither does Taiwan or South Korea or anybody else do it to, to China. So it's a two-way street. People are violating ADIZs all the time, which is why they send up the fighters, which they did in this case, Korea and Japan set up fighters to visually identify who's flying in their ADIZ. And that was the end of that. The pilots saw who was there. They might have waved at each other. The big thing is there was no hostile action or aggressive maneuvering like we saw China do to the American planes recently. Uh, everyone acted very professionally on all sides. All parties were very professional military. They conducted their uh, transit uh, with absolutely no problem. So, hey, in this case, kudos to everybody for not unnecessarily escalating things uh, in the ADIZ. Now, how did I find out about this story? Well, I found out about it from a great service called Ground News. Uh, this service is a news aggregate that segregates stories by news outlets and then ranks those outlets by individual uh, biases that they may have and who even owns them, whether it's an independent media, uh, like one person can own a whole outlet or if it's a conglomerate. Uh, their factuality history, which is how accurately their history has been with all the stories that they produce and much, much more. Something they've added recently here at the top is a jet chat rather GPT summary of the story. So you can compare what the AI would write about this event versus what the journalists have written. And it's really interesting to see the different biases because it breaks it down by, for American standards, left, right, and center biases. Now let's take a different story and take a closer look at what I'm talking about. All right, so here's a great story that was published about 22 hours ago. Uh, the U.S. had intelligence of detailed Ukrainian plan to attack Nord Stream Pipeline, right? And there's a good source, a good mix of left, right, and center uh, people uh, publishing this. So whenever you get your news media, you'll be able to see where on the scale the people you normally read uh, fall. You may already know that, but it grades all of these news outlets like that. Look at this Korean Times. It leans left. It has a mixed history of being fact-based and is owned by uh, Donghua Enterprise, apparently. Uh, Red State, look at Red State and Zero Hedge. Very low factually based reporting here, but they're heavily leaning to the right. And so whenever you open up this tab and you read their story, you can see it takes you right to the website. You can read the whole article right here, and but read it from the right perspective versus the left perspective, okay? And if you're in a different country where left, right, and center is more uh, broken up over different parties and, and, and opinions, uh, you can customize this to the country that you're in and it will reflect uh, your beliefs. I, I have it set to the United States right now because that's the country I'm in and to us, left, right, and center makes a lot of sense. Um, 
I love how it breaks down the story by, by ownership. It says 10% of the sources of this story are independent news sources. That doesn't mean they're right or wrong. Just, just under, understand uh, the 90% of these are not independent news sources. Okay, So they may have an agenda, whether it's selling advertisements or trying to lean politically one way or another. Factuality, look at how much over half of the news sources reporting on this Nord Stream pipeline, pipeline rather, have a mixed history of being fact-based journalism. And it is shocking to me as I go through all these different news outlets, how few of them are actually based on journalistic practices and, and fact-based research and reporting. Uh, a lot of it's left or right from the American perspective. Ground.News has a great service called Blindspot. And these are stories that you may not be aware of because of the news sources you commonly go to to get your daily news or weekly news, whatever. Uh, so you may not even know that certain news outlets are reporting on these topics. You're completely blind to this because you may be on one side of the spectrum, whether it's left or right, and these news stories are only being published on the opposite side of the spectrum that you normally watch. This will help give you a more rounded view of what the world is reading and, and how they view the world based on journalism that they're getting. For instance, if you're on the left and you only get mostly left-leaning news, there is a story that no left-leaning news organization is reporting called 10 billion global population is unsustainable, uh, U.S. climate key envoy Kerry says. And so right-leaning and some center-leaning uh, outlets have published the story. You may not even know that it exists, but you now can read this story and get a better understanding of something you would not even have known about just because it doesn't align with the way you view the world. But this helps round your view, I think, of the world by reading other sources. Blind. I want you to go to ground.news forward slash subbrief to stay fully informed on breaking news, compare coverage, and avoid media bias. Sign up for free or subscribe through my link for a 30% off unlimited access if you support the mission and find it useful as I do. The discount ends on June 30th, 2023. Hey, and welcome back. The United States Navy has released video from the bridge of the American destroyer that had a close encounter with the PL, PLAN destroyer in the Straits of Taiwan, Taiwan Strait. Uh, just recently here, you can see how close the two ships got together. And right before this encounter, the PLAN Chinese destroyer was saying on the radio, bridge to bridge, we're going to maneuver to collide with you. If you want to avoid collision, you're going to have to take evasive action, which the American destroyer did. It just simply slowed down, allowing them to pass in front. But you can see from this geometry that had the American destroyer not slowed down, there certainly would have been a collision. And uh, that was avoided through the proper actions of the United States Navy uh, destroyer crew. This was really unacceptable behavior at sea in international waters. And so I really want everyone here to see this video and uh, just see how close it was. This was a deliberate attempt to ram uh, a Chinese ship into an American warship in international waters. It's ridiculous. But now that I've seen the video, I can tell you for sure that it's the Lu Yang 3 destroyer, PLAN destroyer. We have a very detailed lecture on this destroyer. I'm just going to share a couple of slides with you here. But if you want the full uh, lecture, you're going to have to go over to the Patreon and uh, watch it there. I'd recommend everyone do that. So the nickname of the Lu Yang 3, which uh, began to appear on the Internet around 2012, some pictures were leaked from the uh, shipyards, uh, was Red Aegis because it seemed to have similar systems, combat systems that could uh, integrate weapon systems from multiple vessels vessels, including its own. It carries 64 VLS cells that can shoot long range surface air and missiles, as well as anti-ship and land attack missiles. So there's a lot of variability in there. Nickname Red Aegis. Uh, also, we have a whole list of the active duty ships that are in this class, including two sub variants. There's an anti-submarine warfare sub variant that they made five of. And then all the ones they're making today going forward have the extra long helicopter deck to, um, accommodate the new uh, Chinese helicopter. And so you can see all that there. This gives you an idea of just how detailed our lecture is. We break down every single system in great detail. I'm talking about power levels for radars and sonars, pulse widths, range scales, uh, pulse rates, all that stuff is available to you. And I share it with you in this lecture. Um, the Lu Yang 3, as far as the destroyer goes, is one of their newest designs and uh, pretty capable when compared to their older 
older ships. Uh, they're, they're making generational leaps with each one of these new new variants. But they're still limited to like their region. They do operate out of Africa. A couple ships, I think it's like six total. Um, and then the majority of their Navy is still operating out of mainland China versus the United States. Look at what we're doing, folks. I want to talk a little bit about the Nimitz Carrier Strike Group because I don't see any of this news over here on the United States side of things, and they're doing great work right now. For those of you that don't know, recently, I think it was like two weeks ago, a typhoon absolutely hammered Guam, going right over top of the island, 130 to 145 mile an hour winds, tearing up everything. The island lost power, which means they don't have fresh water. It's a mess. Now, power's been restored to about half the island now, and I hope they're getting fresh water to everybody that needs it. But the entire carrier strike group is providing uh, communication services, including internet, to the local uh, officials, as well as supporting them with food and supplies. Uh, the base there is doing the best that they can to help the community around the base. Because uh, Guam, whenever you're on Guam, it's like being on a, on a ship. You know, everyone's there together. And if, when you get hit with a hurricane or a typhoon, as it's called in the Pacific, um, everyone's in the same boat, as it were. And they're trying to recover from that. So a big tip of the hat to all the men and women out there at the Nimitz Carrier Strike Group helping Guam recover from this devastating typhoon. Uh, the estimate on getting power back to 100% of the island is going to be weeks. So this is a long recovery process. While that's going on, we have the resources in the area to continue to um, monitor the Western Pacific with Ronald Reagan, the America uh, Coast Guard is there as well. If you shift over to the Atlantic side, you could see the Gerald R. Ford Carrier Strike Group is up there in the Norwegian Sea doing operations. And we have a Coast Guard group over in, um, in the Baltic Sea as well. The Bataan's doing work up for her next deployment. The Macon Island over in the Pacific is coming back. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt is, is with her as well. And big kudos to those guys. That was a huge deployment the Macon Island did. They did many things, including visiting Thailand, the Philippines, improving relations with them. Uh, an absolutely monumental underway for the Macon Island and Theodore Roosevelt. Well done to them. So what is the real difference between the American Navy and what we do and say someone like the Chinese Navy who actually has more ships than we have and yet doesn't seem to have the capability that we have. Matter of fact, a lot of the Chinese carriers have come into question lately. A lot of evidence has been released that the new carrier that they have with the uh, catapults uh, may never go to sea because they have structural issues with the steel they use to create the carrier real problem mechanically. But even though they have more ships, they don't support other nations the way that we do. And a big part of that is this right here. I think one of the big differences that sets the United States Navy apart from the Chinese Navy is the naval history, heritage, and the quality of the sailors that we have. The generational knowledge that has been passed down to each one of these sailors, to the people that we have today, is very vital. That's something that China is trying to develop, but it just takes time, many, many years to get that. And of course, while we do have a technological advantage still, they're catching up on that, but they don't have the advantage that our people have. So getting sailors to be motivated enough to actually care about their job, to learn how to take advantage of these very complex operating systems and consoles that they have to use, this equipment that they have to use to do their job, isn't something that's simply done. It takes a lot of motivation and leadership from the top two to keep uh, the sailors up with all the technology. And I have a great story that really reflects this. Let me, let me take you in the way back machine to when I was in the Navy. This was one of my first underways. I was the most junior guy on board this submarine. And we had um, a mission coming up. And in order, and this was not just local ops, uh, war games. This was a real, no kidding, mission where we could not be detected. Okay, Ben, that doesn't, so that's not something you do immediately. That's not like the movies. No, it's something that we worked on for about a year before we actually went on this mission. And that was a lot of late nights doing maintenance, making sure everything was up to date. We did as much at sea maintenance as we could in port to get our submarine ready to go. And then after those long ass work days, we would go to the simulators, we called them trainers, and work on doing this mission over and over again in that environment, simulating everything as sonarmen and a tactical work team working with fire control and the officers to make sure that we were the most prepared possible for anything that might happen in the area 
that we were going to. We did that for almost a calendar year before we threw off the lines and actually did the mission. And that takes a level of motivation that other countries simply don't have, especially if they have a conscription level of, uh, of, of enlisted personnel. You know, they don't, they don't have that senior enlisted that stays year after year consistently in a large cadre enough to be able to um, be motivated and, and do that kind of training to get the mission done. And then we go on the mission. And this is how I know it really mattered. The, the person's really mattered. We're on watch. Everything's going great for weeks after weeks. We're doing the job. It's, it's awesome. And uh, we're all getting great experience. And wouldn't you know it, <laughs> that's when things go terribly freaking wrong. When there's a ship that we had been monitoring for a long ass time uh, and she does something unexpected. Okay. And here we are in a position that is too close to that ship to make a high speed run away and not make noise. And we're also in a geographical location where we are limited in, in our evasion. And this freaking warship's coming right at us. And we're like, what the fuck are we gonna do? You know, the, the sonar system on this warship is just hammering the water like you wouldn't believe. And we're like, you know, my job, because I was one of the most junior people on board, I was the most junior sonarman, by the way, you know, I was, you know, logging events and I was watching some auxiliary gear that I was a specialist on, um, you know, that was recording their active sonar, you know, not to go into any detail. And this ship is just getting, getting closer and closer. And the levels, the power levels are going way the hell up. And, you know, we're getting really nervous down there. At least I am. I mean, everybody else is cool as a cucumber, but I'm not, I'm not cool at all. Um, and the senior chief, senior chief, the master chief sonarman from the office of Naval intelligence that was riding us, he had brought two guys with us was standing next to me because the piece of gear I was watching in this case at this time was one of the most important things that we wanted to get information from. And the power levels of that active sonar transmission were freaking peaking the, the, the equipment that I had and, I, and I'm, I'm logging it down. I'm looking at the master chief and he puts his hand on me in the most calm way. And I felt all the nervousness leave my body. This man's leadership is so strong. And he says, they don't see us. Talking about the sonarman on board the ship that's coming right at us. The captain, instead of running away because we couldn't do that, uh, told us to stop. Everybody's not moving. Like, other than writing in the logs, nobody's moving around the ship. And this damn warship's getting closer and closer and the power levels are getting so high and the master chief's next to me and he's grinning like the Chesser cat. <laughs> and I'm like, why the hell does he find this funny? Like, I think he's crazy at this point. And he's pointing up at the levels that I'm logging down and he's like, they don't see us. Like he's, he's, he thinks this is hilarious. And sure enough, that warship went right by us. I feel like I could look up and see the freaking thing and it went right by us and it kept on going. And the power levels eventually changed and went down over time as they go over the horizon, thousands, thousands of yards away. And I could not believe it. I was like, they pegged. I know the math. I told the master chief, I was like, the, the signals we're seeing, we know that enough energy is getting back to that array that they see us. Their sonar, men, their sonar system freaking sees us. And, but, and this is what I learned that day. The sonar operator somehow did not, did not see us. And I feel like we dodged a bullet that day. I was like, things went terribly wrong, but because of the operator of that sonar system, people like this, but on that team, the opposite team, because they weren't well-trained, they didn't care, they weren't present. They weren't looking at their displays. They might've turned their solar system on and just left is what I think happened because there's no way they didn't get a sunburn coming off the active reflecting off our submarine back onto their screens. But somehow everyone on board that ship missed us. We should have been caught. They should have circled back around and got on the comms and radioed for air support and made a surface and who knows what would have happened then. None of that happened. They just kept on going because they did not care or they weren't trained or they weren't even there. They just turned on their solar system and went back to bed, went, went, went to go watch a movie or something. That's why people matter. And that's why we're better. That's why we're going to win.